when I was eating more vegetarian and I thought I was, I was eating more whole foods as well. I was eating so frequently and that's when I was diagnosed with prediabetes. And so the, the phrase that I like to share with my clients is that the, like what we eat impacts how high our blood sugar will spike, but so does how frequently. And when that's happening over and over and over and over throughout the day, that is definitely going to create an insulin resistant state. And uh, so I think the snacking culture is terrible. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Happy uh, Monday. Uh, I was, I literally just got off a plane from, from Hawaii. So I took a red eye all night. So I, forgive me if I'm a little stupid because I didn't sleep. But anyway, <laughs> regardless, we have Natalie here today. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Well, welcome. Thanks. Hello. Yeah. Well, Thank- good, good, good to have you. Where are you located? I'm located in Southern Oregon. Southern Oregon. Okay. Well, I'm in Washington State, so I'm just on top of you. So I flew right over your house this morning about three hours, oh, ago, nice. two hours ago, something nice. like that. So anyway, <laughs> good for you. Well, um, I, 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 I was kind of looking a little bit through your background and stuff. So I just, I guess, just kind of tell us what you do and how you got started and a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you so much for having me on. I am a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. And I currently am a a colleague of Mary Ruddick. I've been training with her for the last two years. Uh, But my, as you know, for most similar stories for most practitioners is that I got into nutrition and through my own healing story. Um, So I can share a little bit about that and and how I got to where I am today. That would be wonderful. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah, I I started out um, really most of my nutrition journey started in college when all of my symptoms came to a head at that time. And I really hit rock bottom. Um, but looking back, I definitely had symptoms as an early child with, you know, standard American diet. Um, I oddly had very, you know, a lot of yeast infections at an early age in my life. I had hormone imbalances when I first started my cycle. Uh, I also am a survivor of childhood abuse. And so the dysregulation of my nervous system really caught up to me up until when I was studying uh, physics in uh, my undergrad, I started to have debilitating anxiety and depression, uh, a lot of gastrointestinal issues at that time, chronic candida um, symptoms as well. And uh all of that kind of, you know, obviously the, the culmination of that, I, I finally tried to reach out to a practitioner at that time. And I was working with a naturopath and I also was very conscious of the environment and my, my diet, I had cut out uh, some, my first dietary change was cutting out soda. I was like, oh, this is completely unnecessary for me. And uh, I started to work with a naturopath to figure out I had very um, deep cystic painful acne at that time too. Um, And they found out that I had some food sensitivities. So I I went down the whole food sensitivity rabbit hole, Um, but I was also conscious of the environment too. So I thought, why not be, (laughs) why not be vegetarian as well? And, uh, and then I, because of my food sensitivities and being vegetarian, I ended up being vegan for several years and my symptoms just kept getting worse and worse. It wasn't until I finally started to see a nutrition therapy practitioner myself and started listening to a lot of podcasts. I think Wellness Mama was the first podcast that I listened to about um, the Weston A. Price Foundation and bone broth and uh, and potentially the GAPS diet to, to heal your microbiome. And I had cavities that were just, I had like 10 cavities at that time that I was dealing with because of my poor nutrition. So uh, after working with a practitioner, I started to really realize how important meat was for me. And uh, it inspired me also to further my education in nutrition myself. So I went in that route. Uh, Because I studied physics, I had this really great um, perspective of 
problem solving and looking at the body from lots of different angles. And that's helped me a lot as a practitioner and also in kind of looking through all of the nutritional science and looking at all of the different variables that may not be accounted for in current literature. But I I started doing the GAPS diet. The practitioner put me on the full GAPS diet and immediately my anxiety and depression and my uh, my kind of chronic uh, symptoms with like, I was insatiably hunger, hungry. I was, uh, I was actually uh, pre-diabetic at that time. I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes and I thought I was super healthy because I was eating, you know, all the right things that most of us have been told to eat. And I, uh, I was running marathons. I was very active. I wasn't overweight or anything like that. So, um, during that time, actually kind of running back to, you know, my hormonal imbalances, um, when I was on this kind of diet, I, I just completely lost my cycle. So the hormone imbalances were, have been a, a chronic theme for me on the GAPS diet. My mood alleviated. It was very, um, you know, my blood sugar regulation, I think was a big, big component of my energy and my mood. And so, um, I was just felt finally very steady and, uh, and you know, my, I continued with that research and, um, and application for me on and off, um, for many years. And then it's a long story. So I'll kind of cut to the later part of my healing journey, right? So I've been two years on the on and off the full GAPS diet and GAPS, uh, GAPS kind of soups uh, at different stages throughout those years. And I was just feeling almost a hundred percent back to how I felt like I could be right. You, you go on these diets, you never really realize how good you could actually feel. I was pretty close to feeling hundred percent and I was, I had some mercury feelings and um, Alzheimer's runs in my family. And so I knew that that was a potential issue for me. So I thought I, this is the last piece to my, my puzzle. Cause I still was dealing with a lot of chronic candida symptoms. Uh, so I decided to get those out and my health tanked yet again. <laughs> and so I felt like I, I was back at square run and, uh, started to doubt a lot of what I was doing. I was like, is this really the right way? But, uh, but when push comes to shove, it was really, um, I reached out for more support and I realized that it all was my body's way of really ba- taking care of me and protecting me from the the toxins that were in my body and being released slowly. So those I've come to realize, you know, and a lot of people, like a lot of people that our body's symptoms are really not they're really not uh, symptoms, but they are their body's way signs of our body's way of protecting us and actually taking care of us. So they're not necessarily wrong at all. Okay. Well, that's, that, that is a long <laughs> intro. That's fine. That's great. So let me just, for the people that aren't familiar, the, the gaps protocol or gaps dot, what is the, what is the focus of that? What is the purpose? Where did that come from? What's it, what's it generally used for? Yes, of course. So I, have been uh use I've used the the gaps approach which is stands for the gut and psychology syndrome it was uh it was developed by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride mm-hmm. a Russian um, neurologist and nutritionist and so her foundations that have really stuck with me are eating uh, easy to digest foods in the forms of soup um very easily to digest by boiling them and you use a meat stock as a base because that helps with healing the lining of the gut. So the, her, her research has been pivotal, pivotal, not only for the gut and psychology connection, which really, when I read her book and started that healing journey, it was really a huge, uh, it, it explained everything that I had experienced in my life up until that point. And so, um, but it, she also wrote another book called the gut and physiology syndrome. So there's a huge connection between autoimmune diseases and the gut uh, imbalances with dysbiosis or an imbalance of good, healthy flora in your microbiome. And, uh, and so 
by eating those soups, you can actually heal up the lining of the gut and reestablish a balance of those good bacteria in your gut and resolve your symptoms. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, uh, You'd mentioned that you were running marathons. You lost your cycle. I mean, you know, we see that a lot, of, not uncommonly, the female athletic mm-hmm. triad, so it's so-called, where we see, you know, amenorrhea and we often see anemia and, and often stress fractures and things like that will occur. Um, were you on a relatively low-fat diet at that time, too, when you were, when you were doing all these marathons and you lost your cycle and that stuff? I was. Yeah. So I, I, during that time I was uh, vegan and I was intolerant to eggs and dairy. So um, I, well, I was vegetarian and uh, intolerant to eggs and dairy. So it turned out that I was just vegan and uh, I wasn't really following a a particularly, I I think a lot of people would say I wasn't doing it right uh, (laughs) during that time. And not focusing a lot on protein, easy, to, uh, you know, properly preparing grains and things like that, grains and legumes. But even still, uh, yeah, the there wasn't a heavy emphasis on, on fats for me as well. I I tried at that time to do a candida diet. And uh, so lots of coconut oil and things like that, uh, which was, I, I think, a lifesaver at, at that time. But it wasn't the key. I think the animal-based fats have been uh, really a cornerstone for the the fat-soluble vitamins that you can get from those. Yeah, I know some people. You know, they do a they try to do a vegan ketogenic diet, which I think would be really challenging based on what you could eat on that diet. I I, I think I would struggle with that. But there are some people who have tried it, and some claim they've had some success with a little more higher fat version, perhaps. Um, so tell me, so you said you're a functional therapy, nutritional th- or functional nutritional therapist, I think is what the terms you use. How did, how does, where does that, yeah. where does that kind of, do you have to do some sort of, um, training that, that, that you, cause I mean, I know there's, there's dietitians and there's nutritionists. Is this is something separate from that, correct? It is. Yes. Uh, great question. So <laughs> the, uh, FNTP is the functional nutritional therapy practitioner, and you get a certification through the NTA, the nutrition therapy association. Uh, it's a great pro, uh, a great program. It's founded in, um, the research of Dr. A, uh, Weston A. Price. They pull from a lot of different curriculum based on up-to-date research and also anthropological research, which I think is super important for nutrition studies. And they're very unbiased, I would say. There's a lot of people who come out of that program with very different diets that they try to use for themselves. Obviously, a lot of people are doing their studies to to, uh, practice with themselves first. Uh, And then I personally have done... Uh, further education post that with, you know, functional courses through Apex Energetics, where I learned how to uh, review functional blood labs and other kinds of functional tests like stool tests. And then I've done training also with Mary Ruddick, where I've learned a lot more about specific medical diets like low oxalate diets and the ketogenic diet and the uh, also, you know, the GAFS diet, if uh, if that's something that most people need, um, carnivore, low lectin, those kinds of things. So uh, yeah, the NT, NTP or FNTP are um, great, is a great, uh, a great certification course that I think is very robust. Yeah, I was looking through some of your um, social media stuff, I think yesterday uh, on the plane. And um uh, one thing I came across, you said there's some issues with around a carnivore diet. One was if there was some, I can't remember what the what the what the deal was exactly. Maybe you can read, like uh, you you su- suggested soluble fiber played a role in perhaps mm. helping us to clear things out. Can you can you elaborate on that or what you know? Because obviously a lot of people within this community have been on a carnivore diet or currently do it, and some many are having great success. Some as maybe maybe not as much, but. What, what what kind of observations did you have regarding that? And then elaborate on the, on the soluble fiber uh, utility, if you don't mind. Yes. I So I use 
a, a carnivore diet primarily for uh, supporting people's uh, blood sugar regulation. It helps really lower estrogen dominance for some people, like with women that I work with or um, for men too. And it also is a great elimination diet. It's also great for histamine intolerances. So yeah, I've done a little uh, uh series on my Instagram, you can learn about the pros and cons of carnivore diet a little bit more there. And what I found is that for people with ox, a very high, heavy, uh, heavy burden of oxalates in their, in their history, their diet history. So I'll go through people's uh, diet history first to make sure they haven't had a high level of oxalate toxicity. And then also if they potentially have, um, not maybe some people have come to me and they've done a low carb diet and uh, especially like a woman with PCOS or endometriosis who has hormone imbalances or maybe even Hashimoto's they've done low carb, um, but they haven't done, um, they haven't, they maybe saw success at first, but they don't see it anymore. A lot of that I've found to be uh, really supported through uh, with more soluble fiber, adding more soluble fiber into the diet. So a carnivore diet, I wouldn't use in that case either. Um, also, sometimes for some, I do see some clients with cancer and I find that the toxicology issue with cancer is it, we really do need to support the body with detoxification from the liver. So I use soluble fiber primarily in the form of, you know, maybe inulin or, um, or, you know, maybe carrots, onions, avocados, uh, low starchy, uh, soluble fiber and low lectin soluble fiber. So I don't use beans or anything like that. Um, I also use psyllium husk and things like that to increase soluble fiber because I found it really supports with grabbing on to toxins um, or hormones to bring them out of the body. And uh, especially if someone's been on either a carnivore diet or a low carb diet for a long period of time, but then they're still having some hormonal imbalances going on or maybe toxic exposure, uh, um, very heavy toxic exposure in the past. Okay, fair enough. And, and so, um, yeah, because people, someone's asked me, what, what, what are the cons? I, I'm very familiar with the pros of, of the carnivore diet. And, and uh, to be honest, I, I've seen some cons too, but what are, what are your thoughts out, outside of that as far as cons that you've seen? Yeah. So I've seen a few clients of mine who, uh, have come, they've been on the carnivore diet for two or so years and they kind of have gotten stuck with not being able to reintroduce certain foods that they like potentially probiotic foods or, um, like dairy or eggs or other forms of, uh, of foods that would be totally allowed in a carnivore diet, right? So, you know, there's many different forms of the carnivore diet as well. I use uh, a form that's most mostly just a, a low fiber form. So sometimes I'll have some clients include lemon juice to help support oxalate dumping. If they're on carnivore, I'll also allow sometimes tea, herbal teas, uh, or uh, specifically for medicinal um, purposes, not uh, not all, but some of my carnivore clients just need to get into ketosis at that point um, if they've been stuck in that way. So um, because the ketosis, I, the ketogenic diet can really help increase the immune tolerance. So if someone's having more symptomology later on on a car carnivore diet with introducing new foods, then it could be because of their immune system dysregulation. So to reset that, I'll use a ketogenic diet. And then, uh, and so I think that it's very important to add in fermented foods. So you can ferment meats and do all kinds of things within a carnivore diet to get those in. But I often find that some people aren't prioritizing that as much on a carnivore diet. Yeah. And so, I mean, as far as fermented foods for people aren't familiar, I mean, would you, things like, you know, there's obviously fermented forms of dairy, which many of us are familiar with the kefirs and yogurts or things like that. Yeah. What are the things yeah. that are, are out there that, that may be beneficial with regard to fermented foods? Yeah. It's hard to find a good quality in the States, I think of salami or fermented meats uh, in that regard, but that is a, a good option. 
the there's other more traditional ways of fermenting uh, uh fermenting organs yes there's there's a lot of different ways uh ancestral recipes that i i can't tell you off the top of my head of their names but uh those would be good priorities i actually have a client currently who is fermenting ruteri the ruteri probiotic with meat and uh she's has her own recipe that she's designed and i'm going to be getting her to write that up for me to put on my blog <laughs> so others can also incorporate those kinds of really beneficial um, probiotics but if you can't have dairy especially but dairy uh ferments are the the easiest yeah so as far i mean you know and it's it's interesting because you know a lot of people within the I guess, nutrition diet space are very uh, into uh, macronutrient profiles, calories, you know, caloric balance, you know, and, and so on and so forth. It seems like you're more interested in the effects of individual food, foods and how they affect our gut physiology, our, our overall physiology. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. regarding protein requirements? Um, are you with the RDA? Are you more heavy protein where, where a lot of people have come to come to the realization that Maybe that's not enough protein. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I very I fluctuate very uh, much with the protein amount based on my clients' individual needs and bio individuality. But I usually tend to be more heavy protein uh, unless they're doing a ketogenic diet where we just do moderates. We my there are lots of different forms of a ketogenic diet as well, and I always emphasize the more moderate ketogenic diet versus what's more researched and people will um, often, you know, um, critique a ketogenic diet that's the the form that was used. Early, you know, earliest studies were done on very, very high fat and very low protein for epilepsy in children. And I don't use that form of a ketogenic diet. So I think that protein is really essential, especially from my own personal experience. Uh, there's, I feel for all of the women that are taught that really we're not taught at all about protein. <laughs> it's very, very sad. And we're, you know, what's healthy is just to have a green salad and um, get on with it. Um, and then the only thing for a lot of people that I've noticed is as we age, we do need more protein. So I think the emphasis for a lot of people who do go more heavy protein is because of a lot of the nutritional damage that we've had from or kind of the dysbiosis damage that we've had from a modern life and uh, and diet over the years, and that imp impacts our digestion and ability to absorb proteins well. So it, it fluctuates quite a lot, but at minimum, I'd say sixty grams of protein per day for most people, at minimum. Yeah, I mean, sixty grams wouldn't wouldn't get me up and down the stairs, to be honest. But I'm, I'm two hundred yeah. sixty pounds, so there's, there's, <laughs> right. a, there's a big difference in there. But do you have any people that you see this particular condition responds better to this particular nutritional protocol, or is it, is it still dependent a little bit on their background and where they're coming from, or is it? Can you say all these guys need to go this this diet, and all these guys need to go that diet? I wish I could say all of these people need this or that. Uh, I do really bio-individualize it. I have seen patterns though, and I'll share a little of the patterns. So with autoimmunity, we all know that autoimmunity stems from leaky gut. So I do use the gut and psychology or physiology syndrome um, foundations, maybe not the exact diet, or there's many forms of, of the GAPS diet as well, but we'll use those kinds of foundations to help reseal the leaky gut up and, and establish a bacterial change of the microbiome, right? So, and then not all autoimmune diseases need a ketogenic diet, but some really do. So especially when they're more neurological. So for some of my clients with dysautonomia or uh, with MS or Lyme uh, is, is not necessarily autoimmune, but it is a neurolog in falls in that neurological kind of category. I use more of a ketogenic style gaps. And then it really depends on someone's really their goals. I think a lot more people are wanting, have, have the goal, especially when you have these debilitating chronic diseases to really 
reverse those and not just manage them. So if they do though want to just manage them, we might do more of just a low FODMAP diet. A low FODMAP diet, if they have like SIBO or if they, uh, you know, Hashimoto's and SIBO and, or an antihistamine diet, um, primarily with based on that. So those are some of the common. I also look heavily for within those two kind of groups. I look heavily for any histamine intolerances in their history. So that really will establish whether or not I want them to be more carnivore. Yeah. Okay. And some people, I mean, and, and I, my assumption is if, if they have histamine issues, you, you steer them more carnivore. Is that correct? Yes. And mm-hmm. Because there are people that go carnivore and still end up with some histamine issues and some mm-hmm. carnivorous products, you know, preserved meats and things like that. Aged meats tend to be higher in histamine and they tend to have mm-hmm. issues with that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, let me go back to, you know, you, you, how long did you do the vegan diet for again? How long was that a vegetarian vegan it- thing? It was about eight to 10 years. Okay. So, mm-hmm. so fairly decent trial of that. So, so you, you, yes. you know, and yeah. were you in, and during that time where you had you sort of gotten your nutritional education at that time, or were you still just kind of figuring out on your own at that point? I was very uneducated during that time. And yes, I, I, I had a, a naturopath, but I, you know, unfortunately, you can only, I could, I couldn't afford to see my naturopath as frequently as I really needed to, to get the support that I needed with my diet at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, but it sounded like you, um, you weren't eating like a junk food vegan diet. You were trying to, I, were you trying to eat whole, whole foods I was. and things like that? Yeah. Yes. I was trying to eat whole foods. I was, I was in college and, uh, you know, with, with that, you have a lot more exposure to, um, alcohol at some times. I, I felt so terribly when I drank alcohol. So I rarely did it. I also didn't, uh, yeah. So at that time I wasn't eating a lot of sugar. There were times that I, I did because if it was such a, um, such a difficult diet for me to, to maintain and the, really the emotional, um, mental imbalances that I was going through around that time too. Um, and I was dealing with a lot of control issues with my diet. And so there would be sometimes some, some binging after very, uh, several months of restriction of, basic foods really. Um, but you know, a lot of my peers were having sugar or, uh, muffins on a, on occasion. And so I would, my binge would always be on some form of gluten because I was technically gluten intolerant. And, uh, and so I would go off of the gluten for many, very many, uh, a few months at a time and then, and then end up binging on it, uh, with, I think a lot of it was, uh, the the dopamine response to to that you know the gluten in those foods is very addictive. You mentioned you know the gaps wrote a protocol and it has this psychological component to it. Did you notice a difference in your mental health? I guess for lack of a better word, between when you're on a very I guess uh, low fat plant based diet now to a more mm-hmm. sort of animal based diet with more fats in there. Did you notice any difference in your mental cognition, mood, anything like that? Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, like I said, I was studying physics and I was, uh, I was really, um, sharp with the first couple of years of my college, uh, degree. I started to, um, to, uh, work as an apprentice for one of the, uh, pre- the professors there and doing research with him. So I was, uh, do excelling quite a lot up until my junior year. My junior year, I really hit rock bottom with that. And I remember going on, uh, going through some basic, they had us redo a lot of, uh, just tests that we had to kind of, they were testing us on, on previous years modules of, uh, things that we had already learned. And I would just come up blank on those things. And I used to be so sharp with them. And uh, so I really started to see more of a cognitive uh, decline at that time, um, my junior year. And really a lot of that improved 
again, very quickly when I added in protein and fats back into my diet with the GAPS protocol. Uh, but even still over, you know, because of the mercury toxicity, I still didn't feel quite where I was before that junior year decline. And, and that really worried me, especially since um, Alzheimer's does run in my family. So I then started to uh, implement the ketogenic diet for myself. And I saw a huge shift with that. So uh, the ketones, I think were really a big missing link for me. And I feel like I've finally gotten back to over the last year and a half, I've been in more ketogenic and that's really uh, restarted my, my cognitive abilities, I think. When, you know, you talk about functional nutritional therapy, um, are there, are there any assessments that you do that maybe other people aren't using or, or many people haven't heard of to, to figure out how to best address this with, with nutrition? Do you do any special laboratory testing or is it all based on mm -hmm. history and symptoms or how do you do that? Yeah, sometimes I depends on when they get to me. If people have come to me going and they've already been through a bunch of testing from functional medicine doctors, I will usually just pro focus on the diet uh, because the diet really is what I've seen to be the most effective. And then if some people have been on a you know very good uh, microbiome shifting diet for a year or two and they still haven't seen the results that they're looking into, uh, I will have them do more of like a spectra cell test, maybe an oats test or, uh, to see, check for toxicity and micronutrient deficiencies. I find that really the food sensitivity tests lead people in the wrong direction. What I think we need to be focusing on is not what not to eat, but to what we should be eating. Right. And we can uh, resolve a lot of food sensitivities with sealing up the microbiome and the, or the leaky gut and shifting the microbiome. And uh, yeah, so I'll have people do blood labs though, as needed, uh, especially if they have some things like uh, autoimmune markers that we want to test periodically to make sure we're going in the right direction. What you, you mentioned micronutrient deficiencies and then some other maybe toxicities. What are the, what are common things you typically see and what do they tend to be associated with from a disease standpoint? Yeah. So I think heavy metals are more common and our body used to be able to really balance those a lot more, get rid of them. And what I think is really the the key there is making sure our microbiome is really robust so it can support us in getting rid of those toxins. So I've seen some, a lot of the time, um, mercury is, uh, or heavy metals are really related to uh, neurological imbalances or, or symptoms. I've seen that uh, the other toxins like mold toxicity and things like that are, are common. They're a lot more common than, um, than they used to be. And I think some of that also comes down to the microbiome and what we've been previously exposed to and been able to manage. And the other, uh, our bodies really kind of having to prioritize toxic, uh, toxin, re you know, release and getting rid of those. Uh, so oats tests will help me with that, uh, with, you know, checking on those kinds of, um, or the mycotoxin te test, uh, will help me fine tune if there's mold toxins. And, uh, regardless though, with the, the mold, I, I usually find that most people need to, really support themselves with their limbic system. And I, my colleague, Courtney, uh, who also works for Mary is a limbic coach. And so I'll send a lot of my clients to work with limbic system to support their mold, um, toxicity issues. Yeah. Interesting. And so as far as, you know, the heavy metals, where do we typically get them from? I mean, I know I've seen you see like protein supplements, protein bars have been known, uh, some, mm -hmm. some plant foods have, have heavy metals where, where, where are most of us getting exposed to this heavy metal where it might be accumulating? Do you know? 
You know, I, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I think a lot of, I've seen some people with heavy metal toxicity and they don't really have the clear signs, right? Like they don't, ha- they never had, um, mercury fillings or metal fillings. They, uh, haven't had, uh, really when we look at vaccinations, like it is a very small amount. I think some people are more sensitive to those things. So they do, uh, can build up potentially for some people more than others, but that's a really great question. I think, uh, a lot of people get lead exposure through, uh, the pipes in our, our very old pipes, potentially. I know, and I used to live in Colorado and, uh, lead pipes are very, uh, they're, they're just, they've been there for a long time. And so you have to be, be cautious of that in certain areas that you might be living. So, um, those are the basics, but I don't think we need to be too afraid of them as long as we do know what can help detox them. And, uh, you know, for aluminum, aluminum is, is really common, I think, because we are, uh, as much as possible. I mean, I don't know how many of your listeners will be eating canned sardines and things like that, but sardine fish, I don't, uh, I don't think un- it's a really complicated issue with fish. I think fish would be very, very ideal for a lot of us to be eating and can still con- consume. But I think that might be one of the bigger sources of heavy metal exposure that we might be getting. And so that's a big balance, but canned foods like canned sardines might expose you a lot to aluminum. Um, but silica is wonderful to get rid of aluminum. And so if we are getting enough silica in our diet, we shouldn't have to worry too much about some of these toxins and silica doesn't do, uh, doesn't chelate everything, but it, it does help with aluminum. Yeah. One of the, one of the reasons that humans can't eat grass or very much of it is because of the high sil- silicate, silicate, silicon content and the silicates uh-huh. in there. Uh, where yeah. do where do you get where do we get silicates silicon silicates from? <laughs> so. Yeah, I actually use a little bit of a pinch of diatomaceous or food grade diatomaceous earth mm-hmm. to get the silica, and I use it like a trace mineral in my water. So I'll put it in a little uh, pinch when I do a little pinch of salt into my water. I'll also add the diatomaceous earth. Okay, so so yeah, I mentioned you mentioned lemon juice helpful. I, I assume maybe some of vitamin C content. I don't know. With, mm-hmm. with oxalates and you've got diatomaceous earth for the, for, I assume more than just aluminum, it probably helps with a, with a few things. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Especially with connective tissue disorders where there's a real need for silica. Silica is really needed for lots of different things. I, I think uh, blood sugar regulation is a big one as well. So there's, you could use it even if you're not concerned about aluminum. Okay. You know, you're, you said you're in Oregon. How, how does, I mean, are you seeing people locally or is it mostly online or what is your practice? Oh, yeah. Like? I realized when you asked me to share my, my introduction, I just went right into my story and uh, didn't share much about my practice. So yeah, I work primarily remotely virtual with all of my clients. I work with clients all over the world and most of them are finding me through Instagram or through Mary Reddick. Uh, and the, the, you know, a lot of people have heard just the, the healing power of diet and changing your diet to really restore an optimal health. Uh, and I love, uh, I love that I get to re to learn from Mary and, uh, her research with her travels to indigenous tribes all over the world. I think that that gives and provides a lot more value to, uh, to why we're doing the things that we're doing in our diet. So yes, I work remotely. I have a diabetes type two online group and program. So people can uh, join that group and they get online material and then weekly check-ins throughout the whole program with me. And that's a very successful program to help, uh, 
a lot of people don't realize that diabetes type two uh, is preceded by leaky gut and imbalances in the microbiome. And I think that's a huge reason why people um, jump on and off these diets is because of the microbi microbiome and feeding it in different ways that we 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 don't realize we are. Um, and yeah, so that's how I I work with clients primarily. Okay, interesting. And and as far as you know, I mean, because there's a lot of talk about the microbiome, and I mean, honestly, I, I think literally everything we put in our mouth will affect it. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. If you, if you eat it, it's going to affect your microbiome. And the question is. Is that effect significant enough to make a difference? Do we know what it actually means and does not? I, I still find the microbiome to be a, a, a very sort of in a very infancy stage of, of what we know what's going on there. And so when you're trying to impact that, how do you assess whether that impact is actually beneficial or how do you know? Because mm -hmm. I mean, to me, I'm like, I don't know that we know yet, but what are your thoughts? <sighs> That's such a great question. I, I always tell my clients that we only know 50% of what's in our microbiome. And uh, we are made up primarily of microbes of, you know, most of our body uh, or there's more cells uh, that are bacterial in us than, than human. And the, a lot of my clients will ask like, okay, I usually share, share with them to start if we have to do a microbiome shift. I mentioned that there are two food groups that feed more opportunistic bacteria and the, the food groups are starches and refined sugar and in, in some sh other sugars like lactose and things like that. So the, the food groups though, in those, or the food lists in those two food groups is uh, can be argued a lot of the time. So for example, I'll use carrots for a lot of my clients that are not going to shift the, or for a lot of clients, carrots don't impact the microbiome and in a negative way. Uh, and I would say that even if someone has a negative ex reaction to a carrot, I wouldn't think that that's negatively impacting their microbiome personally. However, things like um, you know, very long chain polysaccharides like cassava, maybe too soon in a microbiome shifting diet uh, would, would kind of throw, throw off that trajectory. So I like to imagine it like, you know, a, uh, uh, a field that's being regenerated. So regenerative agriculture is a huge interest of mine. And I think there's a lot that we can learn about our microbiomes through the observations that we can see with how we're regenerate, how we can regenerate the soil of our planet. We are the same as, you know, what I, I think our microbiomes are made of is very similar to the soils of our planet. And so if we try to re, regenerate the soil. Uh, I've seen in some places that have been heavily damaged sites that are very de desertified, or there's lots, there's been a lot of damage to an area, an ecosystem. What we often see first that comes up are very, very opportunistic weeds is what we call them. And even though their weeds, they do have a purpose. So I think that the more we learn about this microbiome shift, I, I don't try, I don't mean to come across like I hundred percent know it, but I think I'll, I also am very intrigued with the, uh, the new research that we're kind of going to be learning more and more about that has to do with how to slowly shift these ecosystems because we cannot do it. I, I, I do believe that we can't do it quickly. So I like the two-year mark for a lot of people to kind of avoid certain foods that might uh, push the opportunistic bacteria over the edge. And then at the same time, we have to learn more about what, what these other good bacteria like to eat, you know? And so how, how can we, focus more on feeding good back the good bacteria and that's really it, I've done a lot of research and in, in the in this and it, unfortunately there's a lot of studies that kind of gravitate towards saying the microbiome needs 
leafy greens and uh, and then lots of um, you know beans and legumes to help. <laughs> feed all that good bacteria, right? And I think that that might work for somebody who doesn't have a dysbiotic bacteria balance potentially. But I think a lot of people throwing those th- foods in too soon will create more damage because they are going to feed mostly the opportunistic bacteria. So we still have a lot to learn. I, I don't know if I answered that question a hundred percent, but those, those are my thoughts with uh, the microbiome research and we still have a lot to learn there. What do you think is the, uh, you know, the, the, what's in the, I guess the modern diet, is there, is there one thing you point your finger at or is it, a, is this a common, do we see too many calories as a, as a, as a society? Cause everybody's obese now. Are we eating mm-hmm. too much ultra processed food? Is it sh- is it high fructose corn syrup? Is it seed oil? What are your thoughts on what we should all be avoiding? Mm. I think seed oils are up there as the number one that is impactful to our mitochondria the most and our microbiome. I've seen some of my clients be very reactive to seed oils. And then I also think that as a as a whole, the my, the modern diet is highly refined, way too refined and, uh, you know, very high carbohydrate. And then we're eating just too much as well, like too frequently. So for me, when I was eating more vegetarian and I thought I was, I was eating more whole foods as well, I was eating so frequently. And that's when I was diagnosed with prediabetes. And so the, the phrase that I like to share with my clients is that, the, like what we eat impacts how high our blood sugar will spike, but so does how frequently um, we eat It impacts how frequently our blood sugar is spiking. And when that's happening over and over and over and over throughout the day, that is definitely going to create an insulin resistant state. And uh, so I think the snacking culture is terrible. <laughs> I also think that uh, in general, what we're eating is more refined and high carbohydrate, which is devoid of nutrients and we're nutrient deplete. And so we're just hungry. We're hungry for nutrition. We're hungry for vitamins and minerals. And uh, and those are more, I think, of the importance that I try to emphasize over calories and even macronutrients sometimes. Knowing what you know now and and having gone through some formal training regarding nutrition, uh, if you were to go back to your plant-based self, you know, whatever, six or seven years ago, how would you have changed that to make it more um, doable or or can it be doable? I mean, what are your thoughts? Because there are some people that seem to be doing reasonably well on a a plant-based diet for relatively long periods of time. What what mistakes did you make in that? And would you try it again? Or would you recommend it for yourself? Or would you recommend it to other people in any way? Yeah, I wouldn't really recommend it for anyone. I think what I appreciate about the plant-based move it, movement in a way is that for me, it it got me conscious about my diet in the first place. And I think though, if I went back in time, I would just share more about what I know now about the, the nutrients that you need from meat and fat, especially fat, especially animal-based fats. There's actually nutrients in those, like the fat-soluble vitamins that we miss out on when we're more vegan or vegetarian. I think people can definitely do a vegetarian diet if you come from, uh, if you've got uh, good genes, maybe, and a good healthy microbiome to start with. But more and more, I'm seeing that people generationally, we're we're going into like the third or fourth generations post, uh, you know, the industrial revolution, and so that just that generational trauma to all of our microbiomes is very advanced. And I think that most people these days have a dysbiotic bacteria in their gut and I wouldn't recommend vegetarian for that reason. Um, but, uh, the, yeah, I think that those are the the major things I would want to share with my younger self, uh, is to, uh, that there's more to nutrition than, um, than, 
I think the the vitamins and nutrients that are just talked about in plants, there's so much more in, in animal proteins and, and fats. You know, why, why do you think we've got such a bias against meat in the nutrition sciences? And I know like, uh, you know, organizations like the Academy of Dietetics, Dietitian, Dietetics and Nutritionists recently found out that they are just conflicted heavily with, you know, all these big food companies they are paying them millions of dollars and they're investing million dollars into those, mm-hmm. those processed food companies. Do you think that's part of it or why are we, why we have such an anti-animal product bias in nutrition in general? Any, any insight into that? Hmm. Yes, it's very confusing, but I think a lot of, it's complex for sure. So I think what, what can shed the, um, shed some light on, and I don't, I don't, uh, pretend to know a lot about agriculture, but I think the more we know about our food, um, and where it comes from, we start to piece together the puzzle that there's so much agricultural subsidies for these plant foods. And, uh, because of that, we have an abundance of things like corn and soy and, there's actually too much of it. We don't know what to do with it. And so I think because of the way our systems are set up with uh, being innovative to create something out of a waste product or an abundance of some sort of food, I think that's where these animal-based movements are coming from. It's not necessarily, I mean, we can, we can go the whole conspiracy route and, and think, you know, it does sometimes feel as if that, you know, it's all about the money and people are trying to harm or, or, or kind of uh, make people more brain dead in a way, or if some, if people are not, healthy, then they cannot, um, maybe make their own choices as easily. And, and, um, there's, you know, some truth to that, but that makes me want to learn more about why, why the systems are really set up the way they are, because I, I really believe that people are just trying to do their jobs right as, as best as they can. And this person's job might be to figure out, what can we do with all this corn? Oh, okay, we can we can make a plant based burger out of it and call it you know corn or something. Yeah, something um, like that. Um, now, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but thank you very much for your for your time and sharing your your experience yeah. and a little bit of your expertise with us. Um, you said you're on social media. Can you share where people can go to find out more? Of course, I am on Instagram. You can find me at at uh, Nutrition with Confidence. And then on Facebook, I have a Facebook group for diabetes type 2. Um, you can find my Facebook page and, and learn about me from there. And my website is nutritionwithconfidence.com. Nutrition with Confidence. Wonderful. That's a great title. And thank you very much for doing what you're doing. Um, rest of the folks, we'll be back tomorrow, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a, have a good rest of your day, Natalie. Bye-bye. Thank you.